we've advanced it a lot more now, and we're actually going through clinical trials for this, for the detection of lung cancer. Hmm. So right now, there are a few methods that you can use to detect lung cancer, but one of them is, uh, and one of the primary ones is to go under the knife for a biopsy. So they actually cut out a piece of your lung Crazy. to send it back to the lab. That's extremely invasive. It and sounds intense, like, the, right? like the middle ages, right? Like this kind of healthcare. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like if you can't pick it up in chest x-ray, you have to go into the knife. Mm. There's There are some other ways, but that those are the general methods that are used today. And our device allows you to just breathe into it. And the data so far supports that we are able to screen for lung cancer at an early stage. We're going through something absolutely historic. Technologies across the board are growing exponentially. It's a disruption that's going to completely redefine the way businesses compete. In the next decade, we're going to lose 40% of today's Fortune 500 companies. The exponential growth of computing is continuing. AI is nowhere near its full potential. Whether you like it or not, that the future cannot be stopped by anyone. Hi there, everybody. This is Mark Verbenkov, and welcome to the Future Tech and Foresight podcast. This is episode number 148. And for those of you who have been uh, listening for a while, especially in the early phase of the podcast, uh, robotics was touched on quite a lot as kind of the main theme of the podcast back then was about automation and how jobs are gonna be impacted. Um, and I'm sure that I will be speaking more about robotics in the years to come, especially uh, humanoid robots, which have been on the podcast a couple times, um, as we are starting to see uh, these robots may be improving a little bit more over the next coming years. Uh, most uh, specifically, there was a uh, short comment or a quick little video clip that's going around where the uh, NVIDIA CD, uh, CEO, Jensen Huang, uh, recently mentioned that we can um, start to expect a couple of significant breakthroughs in the next just two to three years. So uh, I'm sure that there will be some, some more episodes focused uh, and dedicated just to that. Now. I'm not sure he was talking about the technology of today's episode, but what I do know is that uh, I really underestimated how interesting and impactful giving robots a sense of smell would actually be. So with my guest today, we will be diving into all the different ways that robotics, and I guess you could really say you know, our world is going to change once this technology is added to robots, once these robots have this extra sense. I think it'll be really profound and far reaching across uh, numerous industries like biotech, emergency response in general, uh, healthcare and many others, which we definitely get into in the podcast. Um, and I was more than happy to have Cordell France on to enlighten me about the power of this technology and I'm really hoping that you are as amazed as I was. Uh, it was a great conversation. I'm not gonna talk too much more about what it is because I kind of want to get into the conversation, uh, but um, a little brief um, bio about Cordell. So Cordell France is the founder and lead engineer uh, of pioneering machine sensing startup Theta Diagnostics. For the better part of the last decade, he has been working with his incredible team to build a new type of nanotechnology sensor and multimodal AI platform that enables machines' sense of smell. His driving mission is to give machines the sense of hypersensitive smell through machine olfaction and accelerate a new paradigm in robotics and AI. Although his focus has been on the engineering of sensor systems and multimodal AI, he has deep manufacturing and hardware development experience that enables him as a comprehensive product developer and technical leader. His experience spans computer vision, autopilot development, aircraft design and simulation, and natural language processing, swarm intelligence, and optics. He is uh, an excellent guest to have on. I think that you will find the episode to be highly engaging and interesting. And uh, without any further ado, let's get into the uh, discussion. Great. Well, thank you very much, Cordell, for coming onto the podcast today to talk about something that I don't think has been touched on the podcast ever. And that's uh, how robots or how you guys have given robots the ability to smell, which I think is weird and interesting all at the same time. So thanks for coming on and uh, 
uh, talking to us about this. Mark, thank you for your time and thank you to your, your listeners. Yeah. So um, the way that I like to start uh, every podcast is to kind of get a sense of how my guests got in interested into the topic and tech that they're working on. So maybe you can start us off there. Like, what made you get in? I, I maybe I'm assuming that robotics was your first interest, and then the the ability for robots to smell was secondary. Maybe you can uh, touch on how you got interested in in robotics first. Sure. So it really goes back to when I was uh, a toddler. Um, so I grew up on a farm. Hmm. And my father is very forward looking with technology and always trying to integrate technology into agriculture. And he, when I was a child, he bought some self driving software, some self steering software for some of our tractors. And it literally enabled the tractor to steer on its own. Mm -hmm. So when you're a kid, like a toddler, and you see this giant machine moving on its own, it's something straight out of a sci fi movie, right? right like it was right. like Star Wars in real life to some degree. And um, I, re I asked my dad, I go, how do I work on this? How do I be a part of this? Like, I want to make, I want to build these things and build this type of, you know, autonomous systems. Mm. And he goes, you got to be good at math. You got to go into robotics. AI wasn't really a word that was thrown around back then. So it was math and robotics and science. And he said, you got to get really good at that. And so from like four years old and up, that painted my career path mm. for the rest of my life. And so that was really the the seed that was planted for me to kind of grow into AI and robotics in general. And I became really good at math. And that's really the bedrock for all of AI and robotics is, is math and computer science and statistics. So uh, I really started from agriculture, to be honest. Perfect. I, I don't think I've had a guest come on and say that they've been interested in what they're interested in now from such an early age. So, uh, but it's a, it's a powerful story. It makes, it makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. And, and then how about senses? For, for robots. I'm assuming that came later. Yeah, it. I've always been fascinated by computer vision, right? Which is mm. basically machine, the machine version of eyes. And if you look around in AI right now, there's a disproportionate amount of work being done on a lot of the human senses, but particularly on uh, vision and audio, hearing, speech, etc. And so a few years ago, I I was after doing a lot of work in computer vision, I kind of looked around and I was like, what, 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 why is there nothing being done on machine smell? Mm. Right. And there's, there's some work being done on machine smell, but if you really kind of break down, it's not cement, break it down. It's not symmetrical. There's not an equivalent amount of research being done from an AI perspective. And a lot of folks argue that if you want to achieve artificial general intelligence, AGI, to achieve that human level intelligence, you really have to have all five mm. senses. Yeah. So it's sense. not just the brain. Yeah, it's 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 eyes, ears, mouth, nose. It's really all those senses. And we already have superhuman vision. We already have superhuman audio, superhuman speech, etc. But it's not quite, in my opinion, balanced for machine smell or the technical science term is called machine olfaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that was more most attractive to me from a research perspective and a startup perspective because there's less competition and there's a lot of untapped potential there. And so our, my goal and our goal now with the company is to try to really be the leading contributor or one of the leading contributors for giving machines a sense of smell. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, I, was, I was thinking immediately when you were talking about that, that maybe like vision and audio would be more useful for like military applications. And maybe that's where a lot of the funding went initially. And maybe that's why there's a lot of uh, focus on that. Uh, I mean, for the last, what would you say, like two decades or something like that? Maybe even a little bit longer. Um, but I don't think there's a lot of use for um, robots to smell in in the uh, in the theater of war. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. If you if you've heard otherwise, no, you're entire you're entirely right. And if you think about it from like a very very first principles perspective, cameras can they have a really high frame rate, mm -hmm. so they can capture a scene like hundreds of times per second. There's 240 frame per second cameras, 300 frame per second cameras, et cetera. It goes higher and higher and higher. Mm -hmm. And so you can, it's doing recognition several, several times per second. Same with audio. And vision is the highest bandwidth modality that mm -hmm. humans have. And then it goes to audio. And then I, I think it goes to smell actually. So we, the smell is the third highest bandwidth modality. We can't capture nearly as much information as we can with vision. 
But if you think about it from like a dog perspective, the highest bandwidth modality for dogs is actually their nose mm -hmm. because it captures way more about way more data than a human's brain does about or a human's nose does. And a much larger proportion of a dog's brain is attributed to smelling than it does for a human. So there's a lot that we can't do with our nose as humans that uh, are actually done by other beings such as insects and dogs. And I think that as humans, we kind of, we, we look at ourselves and try to materialize that into the world, but we mm. don't think about, you know, everything else because we're, you know, well, obviously we're humans. Why would we not be subject to our own vanity? Right. Sure. Sure. Uh, so I think, I think a lot of the problems that we look at solving uh, are conditional on what's going to help us most as humans and, and with our senses and vision and audio are obviously the uh, logical ones to contribute. And I think that's part of the reason why they've received the uh, original or a significant amount of research and funding throughout the last few decades. Yeah. Um, when you were starting all of this, uh, I mean, you mentioned that there were already some, some uh, I'm assuming companies or at least uh, some research that was being done out there. What were some of the practical applications that were like already assumed that uh, olfactory senses would be able to be useful uh, for uh, within robots? So if you think of a really rudimentary example, like a smoke detector, that's effectively an electronic mm -hmm. nose. It's mm. looking for carbon monoxide, but it's looking for a very, in in, rel in relative uh, aspect, it's really looking for a very high concentration. And it takes, in all honesty, quite a few seconds in order to get a reaction. Mm. So well, as soon as it sees smoke, it doesn't necessarily go off. It has to saturate, that, that sensor has to saturate for a few seconds and it has to have a very high concentration of smoke. There are also other technologies out there called uh, like GCMS, which is gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. What that's really doing is seeing different compounds in air mm. by measuring the refraction of light as those compounds are, are interpreted. So there are there are several other technologies out there, but one thing that we struggle to find is a sensor that can compete with the frame rate of like a camera and get that that really fast response time. A sensor that can be extremely sensitive. So look at like a part per trillion accuracy. Mm. If there's one particle per you know, per trillion, can we detect that? Smoke detectors are on the order of part per thousand or very, very low part per million. And we wanted to be able to build a sensor that was not specific to one compound. So one that could basically look at a series of uh, a series of compounds within air or look at a particular air sample and break it down to say, look, there's 18% benzene composition, 20% heptane, 30% toluene, et cetera, and break that scent down. If you think from a human perspective, like if we if we smell bread being baked, we can't break that down into its constituents parts, but a machine can if mm -hmm. we give it the ability to. So that's the particular angle we were looking at with our sensors. And we're not the best in any one of those particular domains. There are higher resolution um, technologies. There are technologies that can detect more compounds than we can. But when you compile all those features in aggregate, we become extremely competitive and extremely robust. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get into some of the other uh, applications that uh, is useful for your sensors later on. Um, could you go into the actual technology that you guys have developed? I mean, we started it uh, just now, but uh, if you want to dive into that a little bit more, I think it'd be quite interesting. Sure. So we looked at the way humans smell and dog smell and a lot of mammals smell and try to replicate that through physics and chemistry and we use a method called electrochemistry to for our sensors to actually be able to receive the signal for what compounds are in the air and at a high level the way it works is our sensors have a charge that are going across an electrode and the air molecules coming in have are, are they have ions that are specifically charged to that that potential and it works kind of like a lock and key mechanism. So the ions are like locks and then the charge is like a key. And when that lock hits the key, it sends us, it sends a signal from the sensor to the computer and the computer says, Hey, I recognize toluene. I recognize something. And it does this several times per second and does it for different compounds. Every electrode, every one of our sensors has to be tuned to a specific compound. Mm -hmm. So for example, we have a, a sensor card that we call it that has eight different sensors on it. And we stack those together so that we can get 16 different chemicals that we're looking at in the air simultaneously. And so they're all looking, they're all 16 different locks looking for 16 different keys. 
but they all cohesively look for, you know, the scent of whatever we're looking for within the air. Hmm. And that that application is called electrochemistry for the specific sensing technique that we're using. And we've had to interface that with a, a hefty machine learning platform that we've had to build because we're looking, what we're measuring is really an electric current, but it's so small and it's so fine that it can be mistaken for noise. So we have to filter the signal very, very, very meticulously. Otherwise, it just looks like a noise. It, mm. it, it, you can't even distinguish that we're actually detecting chemicals within air. To put it into perspective, like when you plug your phone into a wall, you're looking for, uh, you're getting amperes as the current uh, through the electrical charge. We're looking for pico amperes or femto amperes, which are a trillionth or a quadrillionth of an ampere respectively. So they're very, very small signals. And that's why we're able to detect some of these compounds at such a fine resolution because we're looking for that very, very small electrical charge that is indicative of a compound passing over that electrode. Hmm. And these uh, 16 uh, electrodes, can they be swapped for, for other ones or are these 16 kind of the fundamental building blocks of what most of these scents are that, uh, that are being picked up? They, a little bit of both. So... Hmm. For example, in the healthcare application, there is really a small battery of compounds we're looking for that actually means something. If we change applications, we can look for a different set of compounds that mean something, but we don't have to do a hardware change. Mm. It's really just a reprogramming of the sensors. So mm. for example, if we want to do the analysis of breath, we look, we program that those 16 sensors to do a particular, look for a particular set of compounds. And then if we want to pivot it towards industrial applications, it doesn't require a hardware change. It just requires a programmatic software change that updates quickly, right. um, near instantaneously to detect the series of compounds we're looking for. So uh, it's very rapid to be able to change and, and very dynamic. Very interesting. And I'm assuming that you already have those uh, parameters within the software. So it's just literally a, like a, a, a simple update that with a click of a button, more or less, that uh, you can change from application to or sector to sector. Yes, absolutely. Mm. There's a... Uh, there's sometimes like the device has to change just because like if you go to an industrial application, things have to be a little more ruggedized. If you go to a healthcare application, you know, someone's not going to drop it from 20 feet and expect it to work. Right. So sometimes like the actual device mechanical components will change, but the sensor functionality stays the same, which is how we designed it. We wanted to build out the technology itself and make it robust and dynamic to two different scenarios. Okay, very cool. And um, maybe to make it a little bit more tangible for people listening, like what's the size of this device, uh, the, the sensors itself? Uh, you know, you're you're talking about putting this on robots. Uh, I'm assuming it has to be relatively small, right? It can't be some large uh, box of some sort that, you know, is like a, a shoulder canister on a robot somewhere. Yeah, you're totally right. And that's there because there are technologies out there that like I said, have some of our components that are much more um, sensitive, but they're very large. They take a lot of power. They're very heavy. Our device is about the size of a deck of cards mm. and about the same weight as well. So we have a lithium ion battery that can charge it, that well, that powers it so that it can run for between eight and 12 hours at one time, depending on how much you use it. And we've built that out so that it can be, the battery can be swapped out and we can do a host of other things. But the general size, weight, and power that I think about it is about the size of a deck of cards. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Um, let's, let's dive into some of the applications then. Uh, so I was, uh, I was first, uh, told that like this could be able to, um, sorry, it could, it could note like when COVID is in the air, uh, or like people are breathing out potential COVID, uh, virus strains. So, so is that, is that correct? And if so, how does that work? Yeah, that's correct. There's your body emit when when we exhale, there's so much data in breath mm. that it's it's an, it's a rising field called breathomics, but there are there's so much that you can learn about your body status. Like your breath is really to some degree a status on what your body's feeling, going through and doing. Mm. And there's a lot you can measure there. So when you exhale certain compounds, they can be indicative of certain conditions in your body and certain things that it's going through. So when we look for certain compounds, we can detect respiratory distress. And then from there, we can distinguish between coronavirus or sorry, COVID, influenza, pneumonia, mm -hmm. et cetera. So we can look at different respiratory conditions. 
the good thing is, is we can actually see through, like if you're a smoker, if you're a non-smoker, we can see through that. That doesn't convolute our signal, mm. which is if you are very immersed in the field of breathomics, that's a very hard problem to solve. So that's, yeah, that's, that's monitoring your breath. There's a lot that you can do there. And that's one vehicle that we've used for our sensors to try to bring the technology forward. We've advanced it a lot more now, and we're actually going through clinical trials for this, for the detection of lung cancer. Hmm. So right now, there are a few methods that you can use to detect lung cancer, but one of them is, uh, and one of the primary ones is to go under the knife for a biopsy. So they actually cut out a piece of your lung Crazy. to send it back to the lab. That's extremely invasive. It and sounds intense, like, the, right? like the middle ages, right? Like this kind of healthcare. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like if you can't pick it up in chest x-ray, you have to go under the knife. There's There are some other ways, but that those are the general methods that are used today. And our device allows you to just breathe into it. And the data so far supports that we are able to screen for lung cancer at an early stage. We still have some maturity that we have to do before we can make actually legitimately from a clinical standpoint, make those mm-hmm. claims. But the data so far is supporting that. And there's a lot more we can do because there's a lot more data that your breath it contained in, in your breath that we can monitor and uh, and diagnose. So it's exciting. That that's super interesting. I mean, once you say it, it it kind of becomes obvious that a lot of data would be coming out when you're breathing, but you just don't think about this unless the the information is kind of presented to you. Um, and I think also for well, I guess everybody since we've gone through this whole you know COVID craziness over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, I had to get that. Um, I've already forgotten the name of it, but the the horrible test where they stick the 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 Q tip up your nose, uh, and it's it's horrendous. And I'm sure that everybody would have preferred to just simply breathe on some sort of apparatus that's the size of a deck of cards. Uh, and I guess it would also be much more um, reliable on telling you whether you do have COVID or not. And I'm assuming a lot quicker as well. Yes, much quicker, much more quickly. It's 30 seconds to, from oh. when you breathe into the device and get a result. The The way to think of it, so that it's a deck of cards in size and we put a breathalyzer adapter. So hopefully you've never had to use an alcohol breathalyzer, but if you have, it looks very similar and works in the same manner. So you breathe into it and then you have a disposable mouthpiece, you throw that away and then within 30 seconds, you get a response back. So uh, yeah, we, we actually had to prove that our tests, our, our device was as accurate as the the PCR test back right, in the right. day. And we had to go through several clinical trials to prove that. Um, so we, we were able to, thank goodness, and we're having to do the same thing for lung cancer detection and every other, you know, application that we have. So it's, uh, the medical field's interesting because you can have the best technology and you can prove it works but it doesn't really matter unless you go through clinical trials. So mm-hmm. um, even though we had you know, some early success and everything, we still have a long ways to go with clinical trials before it will uh, ever be to the, you know, the, an actual product release standpoint. Right, right. Um, yeah, well, I, I definitely want to talk about the other applications and other indus- industries, which I think is a lot easier. There's significantly less, I guess, bureaucracy and, and uh, regulations that you have to go through. Um, but as you're, as you're talking, um, you know, lights were going off in my mind about uh, this whole precision medicine trend that uh, has been talked about uh, for a couple of years now about, I think the the most vivid example is, you know, you go to your mirror in the future, you put your thumb to it and it takes either a drop of blood or, you know, a bead of sweat and it's able to tell you kind of like an entire scan of your of your body and like how healthy you are and what kind of I don't know, minerals are missing or vitamins are missing. And, you know, you should pay, take this pill, that pill. Um, to me, it sounds like your tech is is supporting the move into this precision medicine um, world, sector, industry, whatever uh, whatever term we want to call. Um, I'm assuming you guys have thought about this and that it's, you know, the applications are going to be growing over time. Um, could you explain a little bit about your thoughts on that, if, if you guys can? Yeah, absolutely. So you're 100% right. That precision medicine, that personalized medicine aspect mm-hmm. is something that we are heavily focused on and want to capitalize on in the future. And we're building the product towards it. If you think about your dental health, typically most of us take care of that twice per day. Mm-hmm. Why, not, why not do the same thing with your breath, right? Like all you have to do is breathe into the device, 30 seconds, you get a response back. And not only, you might not be screening for one particular compound, but you might just be screening for, I mean, you can look at cortisol, you can look at mm-hmm. all these different hormones potentially. And to get just a, a report back of what's going on in your body really quickly, 
it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Yeah. And your breath is a super great vehicle to to expedite that in. So that's something that we're particularly excited about in the future. And if things go well, then we could potentially put these breathalyzers in the hands of patients, not only doctors, and everyone can have one just like they can have a toothbrush kind of a thing. That's so cool. I mean, terrific market opportunity for you guys. Uh, but also, I think, you know, as is more uh, to the theme of this podcast, what a tremendous benefit to mankind and society in general. Um Thank you. So, so you're you're looking at the, I mean, COVID and, and lung cancer right now. Um, as you mentioned, there's maybe a little bit of regulate uh, regulatory process that you have to go through. Um, how long do you think it would take to to make a switch or a pivot to um, like a more, I don't want to say mundane, but a more like everyday um, test where people could use a? Do you have to like create a whole new software update or like what's what's the kind of steps there and generally like, like how long do you envision that would take so it's really a matter of what compounds can we define that means something for some mm. condition mm. there's a, there's a lot of research out there but we it, we need to be able to quantify so for example we have three dozen compounds that we can detect with our sensors but we have to paint a story with those compounds mm. so like, does what does nitric oxide mean if I find that elevated in your breath? Does that mean you know uh, you're having you're it's uh, you're having respiratory distress? Does that mean um, you're having high cortisol levels? Right? Like, what 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 does that actually mean? So, hmm. to get to that point is a matter of just understanding the research and maybe performing our own because there's not a lot of data for this breathomics uh, field of study, but we really have to figure out what chemicals mean what. And uh, it's not really a matter of if we can detect them. We know we can detect them. We just have to figure out what they mean mm -hmm. if they're elevated in the body. So that's something that's a lot more attractive to me, uh, just in pure honesty, because it's something that's accessible to everyone. Yeah. It's not necessarily making a super large claim as you may have indications of lung cancer or not. It's just, it's like a thermometer, right? I'm going to check your temperature. I'm going to tell you what it is. You make your own conclusions. If it's 105, Maybe you're not in good shape, but maybe, you know, there's, there's always corner cases, but if we find elevations of certain chemicals and we can just give you a report, um, that's super accessible to everybody. And that doesn't take any effort on our part mm. from an engineering perspective. It's really just a software reprogramming to say, what are we looking for? And what, what, what picture do we want to paint for the user? And, uh, so you mentioned, uh, the machine learning that you guys are using to, to, uh, do the work before how relevant is AI as we kind of move into this really exciting, uh, what I've, what I've heard and what I keep calling like this new AI age or era that we're moving into, how relevant would AI be in, in supporting those efforts that, that you just talked about? It's extremely important. Yeah. So we, we have a. Our sensors are the hardware part, and they do a very good job by themselves, but by themselves, they're still not that remarkable. It takes a lot of machine learning and AI to actually make those possible, or to make the, uh, extract the efficacy and the accuracy we need. So we actually have an AI platform we built. It's called Alchemy, and it's it runs a lot of our sensors and multiplexes all the signals together because one thing that, like it's, if you think about our device as a thermometer for all the compounds within air, that's one thing, right? If we know toluene's in the air, we know benzene's in the air, that's one thing. But how do they react? Mm. You have to have, like, that. that's knowledge that you can't really, you, you, that you have to use machine learning for. It's just too dynamic to program it from a hard uh, logic programming perspective. If you bring the problem out even more, uh, our, like, measuring breath is a very contained application because the breath goes right over the sensors and it's contained within a chamber. And so it's not subject to all the other things going on outside of it, all the aerodynamic changes, the uh, um, environmental properties, et cetera. If you look at it from a navigation perspective, like if we were to look at it from an application for what dogs do, where they're tracking ascent and navigating basically with their nose, that becomes a much more challenging problem. And there's even more machine learning AI that needs to be used in that because now you're subject to changing air conditions, changing wind patterns. If there's an HVAC system in the building, that becomes, I mean, right. it can help you because you're bringing air from across the room closer, but you're also swirling it around and making and distorting the signal. So that type of understanding of mm. aerodynamics and how environmental conditions can influence what the trail of scent looks like from a navigation perspective is an excellent candidate for our AI machine learning. And that's something that we've been building, spending a lot of time building out the last few months. Right. Um, and I'm assuming as 
uh, these AI tools become more and more powerful, it'll, it'll just become easier for you guys to uh, do those kinds of calculations and figure out exactly what's going on in the environment to make your tool substantially better and, and more useful. Um, yeah, super interesting. Um, should we move into the other, uh, maybe more industrial applications? Um, so, I mean, healthcare, I think, is, you know, fascinating. I'll definitely have to look into what you guys are doing a little bit more um, after the podcast. But um, what about industrial applications? So for industrial applications, one thing that is particularly exciting is the application for space. So mm. right now, the GCMS, the gas chromatography mass spec system, you don't have to remember that word, but basically think of it as something the size of a fridge that goes up into the space station um, and all the smaller versions get put on rovers to look for signs of life because they're looking for compounds in the soil that might be indicative mm -hmm. of life or other minerals or water, et cetera. These are very heavy systems. They're very power hungry. They're hundreds of pounds. And every kilogram or pound you put on a payload to a rocket is millions of dollars, right? right so it's right. not, it's, it's, it's what's being used now, but when you have something the size of a deck of cards that you could put on a rover or you could put in the space station, right? That becomes very attractive, especially when the performance is comparable. So with the compounds that we have now, a few of them can be used in a space-based application to, for example, look for propellant leaks or look for um, mm. uh, various compounds that might indicate life on other planets. And so that becomes very attractive to put these on rovers, et cetera. If you look at some of the other applications like agriculture or um, there, uh, there's from a navigation perspective, there's just to zoom in on agriculture for a second, there's not a super good closed loop way of monitoring chemicals that are applied to field or fertilizer that is applied to fields. So when a farm implement goes in and ap applies the fertilizer, how do you measure and make sure that there was an even distribution? You can do some of that with drones, right? Doing infrared and, and spectrometry monitoring, monitoring. But if you can have this kind of electronic nose that can go and make sure that uh, you could be pulled behind the implement or something to make sure that there's an even application, that's pretty attractive uh, from an agriculture perspective. My personal favorite is the navigation by scent because it allows for new ways to navigate underwater mm. and also navigate within, uh, well, within, within on land. So on land, for example, we could put, we have, and this is actually the original use case we built our sensors for. Okay. We put our sensors on a drone and we're able to detect explosives, TNT, C4, et cetera, and use that as a means to clear out, you know, soccer stadiums if a potential bad actor is in there mm. or any other any other building, right? So these drones act like basically in, in a very analogous manner to a hound dog, right? When you set a pack of dogs out into the woods, uh, you send a bunch of drones and they triangulate the scent. So it's a very that's my personal favorite because it's a very hard problem to solve. There's so many different environmental conditions that influence what's actually going on. And the I just really want to bring forth the ability to navigate by scent to the same ability that a dog can, right? When you go to an airport and you see dogs sniffing for yeah. drugs and C4, right? Like it's a, it's the exact same thing. That's what we're doing. Hmm. We're just trying to do it with machines. If you look at underwater navigation, you when you go deep enough, you can't see anything because it's very dark right there's no light permeating uh sonar is basically the only way to navigate and it has its own its own faults radar doesn't permeate navigation or gps doesn't go through water obviously mm. so you can navigate through scent similar to how some of the bottom dwelling creatures like crabs do they navigate through tracing chemical paths within right. within water right so that's also very attractive and something we're working towards because uh, it could enable a whole new form of underwater navigation that's super interesting. Um, yeah, I, I didn't think that there would be so many applications, but again, once you say it, it kind of becomes obvious, right? And it, so it sounds like most of these things are beneficial, right? Whereas like, you know, um, machine vision or, or um, auditory uh, tracking can be used for, well, military uses. Olfactory definitely sounds like there's more benefits to society than, than otherwise. Um, 
Yeah, it's the. I think I think the analogy of using uh, dogs to track. I I would assume also like drugs and airports and weapons and all the rest of it. Uh, this is something that could, rather than going through some, you know, what are what are those large body scanners where you have to hold up your hands and it scans your whole body? Exactly. It could also be some sort of olfactory sensor in there that uh, that detects things like that. Um, it. I mean, as as we're talking here, it really sounds like the market is quite enormous for the for the work that you guys are doing. Yeah, it's there's it's there's a lot going on that people don't or a lot of potential rather that Yeah. I don't think people realize um, the art this field of artificial intelligence right now is really and rightfully so has been really hammered with uh, a lot of press from large language models and chat GPT and uh, there's a whole other realm of AI that can be done, especially if we want to contribute and or really manifest artificial general intelligence. If you look at these humanoid robots. Right, figure has just gotten billions of dollars worth of funding um, through Amazon, Deep, Google, etc. Uh, other companies like Aptronic and Tesla Bot. Right, if you've seen the Tesla humanoid robot, those all have eyes and ears and mouths to speak. They real a lot of their goals are to put them on assembly lines and put them in factories and to put them in homes, even right, following like the true Yep. I robot, Yep. uh, <laughs> the true I robot plot, but. You could argue that they need smell, right? They'd be very helpful if they could smell a gas leak, if they could Yes. smell something, right? So Yes. you need there's not currently a method that's built into those humanoid robots. And I think that's that's another that's my personal uh favorite market because I think we can contribute there quite heavily. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, imagine. I mean, I have uh, I've um, unplugged my fire alarms here because they just go off all the time, even though there's nothing burning. But if there was some sort of you know household robot that would be able to sense that and not have this high pitch, uh, high pitched, annoying uh, squeak, <laughs> but say like, hey, there's a fire or there's smoke. I mean, that would be that would be so much better. Um, very cool. I, I love this podcast for all these kind of like future ideas of what's uh, potentially going to come out. Um, we haven't talked about the challenges that you guys have gone through. I mean, of course, there's, you know, the regulatory issues in the medical field, but uh, could you touch on, it doesn't just have to be like tech challenges, because I, I know that that's challenging in and of itself, but have there been other, uh, or what have been the challenges to, to um, build this kind of technology that, you know, I'm getting more and more excited about as I listen? There are a lot, but to highlight a couple, from a machine learning perspective, it's been very difficult because every machine learning model works off of learning through a bunch of data. It takes training data. And with vision, that science is really prolific. There are a lot of people that understand machine vision, machine hearing, et cetera. And there's several data sets online you can download to get a, 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 an image recognition model going or something like that. There's no... real there's no training data for smell and there's not even a good data representation so Mm like -hmm. images are represented in jpegs pngs audio files or in dot wave files or mp3 mp4 files but what is a what what what's a data point for smell what does that look like is it a spectrogram is it something different is it a graph so trying to define how we should not only learn the sense of smell but like what the data medium should be where do we how do we acquire training data we've had to build out all of our training data And from a scientific perspective or a statistical perspective, that's dangerous because you're kind of drinking your own Kool-Aid, right? You could be, you might not actually be finding the patterns that you think you are um, if you're kind of, if you're getting high on your own supply, if you will. Right, right. So we've had to take a lot of statistical measures to make sure that uh, we're actually building things in accordance to the state of the art. <clears throat> and we use the GCMS. Everything we build is grounded in the GCMS so that we can ensure that uh, our sensors are uh, being They're actually being built according to the state of the art and the representative to the state of the art. The other thing that's been challenging is regulation because we're not only using artificial intelligence, but we're also using a new technology that they haven't ever heard of before uh, or that they're not familiar with rather, which is electrochemistry. So we actually failed in our FDA submission for the COVID-19 detection device because they came back and said, look, your data seems credible. We like it. But you're using two things that we don't like, which is a new technology we're not familiar with, and you're using black box AI. So we came back and we're like, well, I mean, respectfully, we're building AI the exact same way everyone else is building AI. 95% of the world's models, artificial intelligence models, are built with, at the time, uh, Meta's PyTorch framework or Google TensorFlow framework. Right. So we had, to, they said, well, we don't care. We can't understand what's going on inside. So sorry. So we, we had to go back and build out a full platform that's replicative of 
Google's TensorFlow, if you will, but is inherently explainable. So our tech, our machine learning has a heavy explainability and transparency perspective mm -hmm. because we've realized that if we want to make it to the regulatory hell, we've got to make our AI models explainable and we've got to make them transparent and we have to gather trust. We've got to be able to see within the black box, if you will. And um, that's the only way that we're going to ever make it from a regulatory perspective. I've learned a lot from that because if you think about a lot of the competing AI companies right now, they're very focused on making more intelligence and making the next capable machine learning model, but they're not necessarily focused on making them more transparent mm. because they just don't need to yet. We're still in shock and awe that ChatGPT is so good, even though I can't understand exactly what's going on behind the scenes. But it's going to come to a day where we're going to want to have AI models explain their decisions just like a, a human can. So we're highly capitalizing on that. And um, it's even though explainable AI has been something that we've had to build as a means to our own solution, we've seen that particular aspect of our framework be attractive to a lot of other folks who uh, are having similar issues getting regulatory approval. Frustrating, interesting, but very frustrating. <laughs> and I, I can only assume the amount of time that it would take to, to do something like that, to make it um, acceptable for these, for these regulators. Um, what about, um, the, the, the accuracy of the scent detection of your devices? So, I mean, we touched on this a little bit before, um, are you experiencing like increased reliability or increased accuracy as these, uh, AI models are getting better and they're being trained on more data that you guys are creating yourselves? Like, do you see within five years or so, like there will be probably like zero issues or 0.1% or issues with detecting the sense that you guys have, or are you already there? We are getting more accurate as we gather more data. And the, the biggest thing that is or one of the most difficult things as we gather more data is we learn how different chemicals fuse together or they react in air. So it's, it's even though we built our models to detect, you know, what toluene looks like and what benzene looks like they look different when they're in the air together because they might react or they might give a different signal so that's been challenging and we've had to build new training data to accommodate for that and new machine learning techniques but the accuracy is definitely improving and our resolution has been improving too so when we first started this we were at a part per million uh, mm -hmm. resolution so we really weren't anything to write home about we really weren't super competitive we built as we built more and the technology grew, we got down to a part per billion resolution. And then now we're at a part per trillion resolution, working, trying to work to a part per quadrillion resolution. Mm. So there's a there's an inherent limit on how small you can go, right? And like from a healthcare perspective, we don't really need to be better than part per billion because just that's based off of our data so far, that's all we need in order mm -hmm. to be competitive, in order to be accurate. But yeah, as we, we spent a lot of time gathering training data, which we intend in the future to open source to other companies also trying to work on machine smell, machine olfaction, because like I said, there are no data sets out there for training. So we have to manufacture that training data and we hope to enable other companies to capitalize that on the future too. And um, uh, I, I forgot to ask this, this training data that you're creating, is that going to be open to like your competitors in the future based on the needs of the, the regulatory process that you go through? Or is this like your data set that you're going to be able to, you know, store and be competitive with uh, as time goes on. Because it, it, it sounds to me like there's a, there's a pretty substantial capital investment there uh, or time investment, however you want to look at it, to create your own data. Uh, it would be kind of a shame that it, it, you know, goes out to your competitors and they don't have to, they don't have to do all this kind of work that you guys have put in. Yeah, there's, there's several models we're looking at, right? Like we, the, the most compelling was to, is to license it. Is mm -hmm. to license the data mm -hmm. and build a, you know, kind of a subscription based off of it. There's, there's other options. The open source route's not my favorite. And I don't think we'd open source everything, but we'd have to, we, we might make it as a, as a try. We want to catapult investment and catapult um, more research into the field. So we might have to do a little bit of open source just to try to get the tech community in order to buy in and see that it's legitimate. But yeah, I fully agree. It's not in our best interest to open source everything because it is taking a lot of our time yeah. and a lot of research to acquire that data. And I mean, to some degree, our company's built on it. So we can't really give away all of our IP for free. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally get that. Um, I, have, I have one question here about, and I don't think we've talked about it at all, the uh, cloud infrastructure. So this is something that uh, was shared with me beforehand. 
how important is that for what you guys are doing and actually creating this this sensor um, to, to work properly? So our cloud acts as the supervised trainer for everything. The device itself has a machine learning model that can interact or that you can use without having to interact with the cloud. But what happens is, so if you can imagine several hundred devices are out there mm -hmm. and not all of them are connected to the cloud, but they all have their own local machine learning model. We use something called federated learning to control what each of those models are learning. We're not at a point right now where we can freeze our machine learning models and say, yeah, you're good to go. You know everything. We have to facilitate continuous learning. On So every mm -hmm. every new test that comes in, it's actually learning with that test. The model is not frozen. It's actually adjusting itself. You can imagine how that can become a runaway train, right? Especially if it's getting bad data. So periodically, we send all that data and all those models back up to our cloud. And our cloud basically consolidates them all together and unifies them back into one master model. We call it the mother model or the master model. And then broadcast that master model back out. So now all the same models are grounded again with the same baseline. But in reality, each of those models learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And so model A might have, I mean, breath looks different in Europe than it does in the US just because mm -hmm. of lifestyle habits and just because of, mm -hmm. you know, different geographic changes and everything. So we can basically acquire US data from the master model and still be using the European based device. So it's extremely helpful for making sure that we round out the distribution of smell and different compounds that we're looking for. But the cloud plays a huge component, a huge part in making sure that uh, we're growing organically with our data and we're actually learning uh, in a controlled manner. And do you see like, is it going to take three years, five years before you get some uh, stable uh, model for like one of the applications that you guys are using? Or do you see that this this uh, continuous learning aspect is gonna, just going to happen forever because there's, you know, as you said before, you're, you guys are creating the, the data right now. From a selfish perspective, I like the idea of continuous learning because that's what humans do, but the regulators don't like that. They want something mm -hmm. that's locked. So we're at a point now with a few compounds where they're locked and we don't have to do continuous learning. So, um, for example, like uh, nitric oxide, we don't have to do any more learning. We have so much data on that that it's a solved problem, and we just lock that compound. That model is doesn't we don't we don't do any more continuous learning with that. But others that are more rare that we're not quite confident in the signal that we have, that those are continuously learning. And we have a number that we have to hit that like a goal, a target that says when we get so many quality data points, then learning can stop, um, or we don't have to update. We don't have to do federated learning as much. That type of a thing. So there is a value to which we 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 don't do that anymore uh, because we have to appeal to regulators. But in general, I'm a fan of always always updating models and continuously learning. Okay, okay, <clears throat> and maybe um, you know as the as the time is winding down here, maybe looking more uh, towards the future here. So we've talked about a number of the different applications. Is there maybe it doesn't really um, uh, matter, but my question here is. Are there any robots that are going to be easier to adapt your technology to? Like if I'm thinking, if I remember correctly, the name like Spot, right? The 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 dog quadruped uh, versus a drone, right? If Spot is moving a little bit slower, maybe it would make more sense and they're going into um, uh, very specific kind of locations uh, versus a drone where things are moving really quickly and maybe the air turbulence is going to be a little bit harder to adapt your sensors to. Is that is that correct? Or um, do you have like maybe one or two type of robots where uh, your technology is going to be, okay, within three years, it's going to be on there and it's going to be used kind of all the time. So you're spot on with the drone. Uh, so the short answer to your question is yes, humanoid robots and more of those quadruped robots like dogs are or, or the like spot mm -hmm. are the easiest vehicles. I mean, we could do that today okay. uh, if if we wanted to. Um, we have a lot of, I, mean, I have a robotic arm in my background. We run scent tracking on that all the time. Mm -hmm. So that that's, that's kind of a, that's something that's more realistic today. And it's a much easier problem to solve with the drone, the rotors, they help you and they hinder you because that rotor wash starts to drown out the signal. But they also act like a vacuum to some degree because they pull in air. Mm -hmm. So it's a very hard problem to solve that's not necessarily to the actual signal of smell, but just trying to get the air to stabilize around it. Uh, but yeah, drones drones are probably the most interesting case, but they are going to be a much harder problem to solve and we don't have it solved yet. 
we have a solved in simulation, but that never translates to reality. So right, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're uh, we're still working through that. But yeah, I think humanoid robots, and then obviously uh, quadrupeds are, are the easiest vehicles there. And um, for space applications, how long is that going to take? Do you think? It's really just a matter of someone that's willing to give us a shot and put these things into a, a space representative environment. Mm -hmm. That's that's really it. We could do that. I mean, we could we could run tests today. We have compounds that we've been studying from research that's available online for what is being looked at for representations of life on other planets. So we've tried to take those compounds and properly characterize them so that our sensors know exactly what they look like. But we, yeah, it's just a matter of someone giving us a shot. That's all. Fair enough. And um, uh, so, I mean, we've talked a bit about the the regulatory um, uh, slowdown of things, I guess, but like, do you think that if there's going to be another COVID or another coronavirus or some sort of, you know, plague that slows down and stops the, the global uh, economy in the next 10 years or so, um, do you think that there would be a regulatory push to have your technology or some competitor's technology to replace the PCR testing that we have and make, I would assume, a global shutdown much less possible if we're able to just test things within 30 seconds um, and you know isolate people really quickly in that way? Or, or is the regulatory uh, world so, uh, I don't know, uh, stuck in its ways that that wouldn't necessarily happen? I have a really, I have a lot of answers to that question. There's, I, I've been so amazed in both positive and negative ways about how certain things were, were are handled with from a regulatory perspective that I don't, I don't think I can accurately predict mm. what they will and won't do. I will say that I think that we are an interesting candidate to them in the future if something like another pandemic happens because we, we've shown they have the data now and we've shown them that they know what we can do. And it's just a matter of taking a leap of faith in new technologies, which if we're going to solve tomorrow's problems, we need to probably look at newer technologies. And I think it's it's largely, we know now what we have, the data we need to prove to them further, if that ever were to happen again. But And we're going through that right now at the lung cancer trial, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, I hope, I do, I do see that there is a large reluctance to leverage new technologies in regulatory landscapes because the consequences for somebody going through, for a regulator approving a new technology and then being wrong, they lose their job. It's very severe. Right. If they just say no to everything, they get to keep their job. Yeah. So there's, there's a, there's a large imbalance on, on their incentives. Right. So, I mean, anyone in their situation is just on the safe side going to say no to something because they don't want to take a risk, but um, and it, this goes beyond healthcare. This is really any regulated industry. For some of these newer problems, though, there is an inherent risk that needs to be taken in investment in new technologies in order to accurately solve them and move the state of the world forward. And so I hope that, especially from like uh, an explainability perspective, I think for artificial intelligence, if AI developers and AI companies can focus on making AI inherently transparent and explainable and interpretable, I think that will give regulators a much more comforting feeling and catapult their decision to start to actually or accelerate their decision to actually move new technologies forward. Because if you if you just ask something a question and you don't under and it just says it doesn't give you a response, right? You're just asking a black box a question, then it's of course you're gonna be scared or suspicious of it. So sure. we're trying to lead from the front and build explainable tools into it to make sure that uh, RAI is accepted and these newer technologies like our electrochemical sensors are, are uh, accepted as well. So it's tough to say, but I think we're taking the right steps. And I hope that, um, I hope that, you know, if something were like that were to happen again, that uh, we're a good candidate to try to solve the problem. Very positive outlook on, on the future there. Um, I mean, and from from everything that I've been hearing, I, I certainly hope that it, uh, that it works out over the next couple of years. I mean, um, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about the, the, uh, precision medicine or personalized medicine and, um, you know, for, from all the people that I have around me that are in great health and then some that are not in great health. And there could have been, if there could have been like a technology that you just simply breathe on it and, uh, the, the medical condition could have been, um, uh, found out a lot earlier. Uh, I mean, 
I think this technology is going to be amazing just just for that, not to mention all the other applications that we've talked about today. Uh, so yeah, very, very exciting and interesting future. And I wish you guys all the best on uh, going through the uh, regulatory hurdles and the technological challenges that you guys have, but it sounds like you're on the right path. Um, Cordell, thank you very much for coming onto the podcast. Uh, I'll have your uh, Thetic Diagnostics website up on the show notes. Uh, I'm assuming LinkedIn is how you would like some people to reach out to you. Uh, are there any other ways that uh, people can follow your work, um, read about what you guys are doing? Um, you know, the floor is yours for that. Yeah, LinkedIn is the most appropriate medium. Our website, we're also building out some more of our, to, a showcase of more of our research and kind of yeah. a, a blog that just educates people on the general science of machine olfaction or machine smell. So yeah, our website and LinkedIn are the most appropriate mediums. So uh, I just want to thank you in advance to, or thank you for your time and thank you to your listeners. Uh, I'm a fan of your podcast and your show and it's just a privilege to be on here. So thank you so much. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for coming on and uh, opening my mind a little bit more to one of the other senses that I think robots need, uh, definitely need in the future. So thanks again. Of course. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening to this week's Future Tech and Foresight podcast. If you like what you've heard here, there are, of course, a number of ways that you can support the podcast. The best way would be to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or give a rating on Spotify, which you can find a step-by-step -step explanation for on the futuretechandforesight.com website. Alternatively, feel free to leave a comment either on the episode show notes or the YouTube channel where you can see video recordings of the interviews. And finally, if you are part of an organization that is aware of the disruptive and transformational impact that emerging and future technologies will bring and want to know more, please get in touch to hear about the strategic foresight services that we offer and how we can help future-proof your organization and take advantage of the phenomenal opportunities available to survive and thrive in the future. A lot of future shock people and future shock institutions in our society are simply overwhelmed. Once there is super intelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the super intelligence does. Science fact is catching up to science fiction. The first truly intelligent machine will be the last invention that humanity needs to make. The only scarcity that will exist in the future is that which we decide to create ourselves as humans. Within a 10 year design revolution, we can have all humanity living the highest and living anybody's ever known. Progress is uh, accelerating at an exponential pace and it's gonna reach a point where progress is so fast it's going to be a singularity. We are probably one of the last generations of homo sapiens. Every single headline points to the birth pangs of a type 1 civilization.